The following presentation was recorded at the 2014 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2014 for helping make these videos possible. All right, so I think we've got everybody and it's about time to start. So we'll go ahead and get rolling. So before we get started, how many folks in here have never programmed before? This is targeted at one in the back. Okay. How many folks have ever touched Ruby before? Okay, a couple. So for you guys, the first part of this is going to be review. So we're going to get started. My name is Robert Marshall. I am a data architect by day, and by night I am the lead systems administrator for an online game called RetroMud. So I have been doing a lot of scripting. It's been about 20 years, and of course when you script, you start off solving problems. And my first problem was this lovely thing called matrix math. Started it in college, I hated them, had to figure out a way to get by, Fortran was the best thing. But you can't be happy with one. And I got into another online game, started fourth. Moved on a little bit, wanted to tweak my system and the base system for that. Moved on to C and C++. And you know, kept going to the web, because you have to have a website. And my life kind of went on. And there's this thing that you learn as you go, that there's lots of languages that solve lots of problems. But there's one problem that's kind of difficult to solve. And that is, when was it fun again? You know, you start off in that first problem that you solve, it's, it's like magic. You get through it, and you figure it out. And after a while, everything starts to look the same. But you go, well, do I use Perl? Oh wait, I have to bolt on object orientation and I want to model something. Do I want to use Java? I don't want to have the overhead with Tomcat or whatever uh, server you're going to put in there to run it. So what are you going to do? And that's where I ran into an article by this guy. It was back about 2003. It was an old article he'd written for Informant. And he basically said that he looked at all the languages that were out there. He wasn't happy with them. So he came up with a philosophy of conciseness. That is, he wanted a language that would do everything in as compact a manner as possible. If any of you have written stuff to deal with text in C, you know that you end up with something about the size of this wall to get through a simple string, whereas in Perl, it's a one-liner, easy enough. I have to stand right here, apparently. I have no range of motion. So, you want consistency. It should be like other languages. You should be able to jump in for free. If you know another language, it shouldn't be too hard to pick it up. And flexibility. You know, a lot of languages, you can only do things in a very certain way. You know, Perl is not. Perl is. There's more than one way to do everything. So he wanted to get some of that into a language that had a bit more object orientation. And really, the big thing for me was he solved my problem, which is this. You know, you feel joy when you can concentrate on the creative side of programming. So he designed to make me happy, the programmer. And that's something that, you know, a lot of languages don't start out here, and that's what really attracted me to Ruby. Because it was designed to make my life easier. So, there are three ways you can start with Ruby, once you have it installed. There's the command line, just Ruby, whatever your script file is, easy enough. Just like anything else in the scripting language. You can do it through the interactive Ruby interpreter, IRB. This is where you can kind of go through and watch. We're going to use both of these as we go. And then also there's RI, that is your documentation. For those of you who have come from Perl, this is Perl doc. Okay? So anything you want to know, internal libraries, classes, you can even generate your own. So when you distribute it, this works for your own classes when you distribute your code. So that's kind of your point of entry. Now, of course, you start off with Hello World, because where else do you start in programming? And that's it. Puts Hello Ruby. So we're going to go to a, a, the demo. This is going to be really easy. Come over here. That's it. 
And it's just like you saw, it's a little bit in color. Is that too hard to see? Heard. Okay. So again, that's it. So very similar to Pearl. Obviously, it's just a one-liner. So we're going to move on to something possibly a little more complex. Math. So can you guys see the slide on there? They said to make it dark so the camera could see it. So maybe the camera has better eyes than we do. So we're going to go ahead and go with some math. There we go. See? That's what I get for listening to instructions, huh? So obviously, we've got a couple mathematical operations up there and their expressions. And this is basic math, right? So 4 plus 2, just call it out. What do we think that's going to come out? 5 minus 3, 6 times 2, 9, minus, nine, nine divided by 3, 7 divided by 2. We've got some programmers in the room. Awesome. And then 7% too, or modulus. Yep. How many folks didn't know that that would come out to be uh, 3 for 7 divided by 2? Anybody? OK. So we're going to go ahead and fire up the Ruby interpreter. This is what you get. Just drops you into a Ruby command line. And the nice thing with this is you can just literally get feedback. So what you see here is you type in, and this is an expression, and it just tells you what the value is. Now, I'm not assigning it to a variable. I'm just saying, does it work? And this is kind of your bootstrap to figure out, is what I'm thinking is going to happen going to happen? It's a great way to just play with it when you're getting started. There are actually a couple websites. If you don't have a machine where you can install Ruby, so you don't have administrator privileges or you can't get in, Websites give you this for free. So go to Ruby, uh, rubylang.org, and you can find a couple of them there. So again, everything is going to be as we expect. So let's just do that fun one. All right, we expect that. Now, the interesting thing here is Ruby has, this interest, has something going on under the covers. Everything is an object from a simple integer, without even declaring it as an object, to a string, everything. Every method is an object. Every single line you write in Ruby under the covers is an object, period. Object oriented from top to bottom all the way through. And it's both a blessing and a curse because it does incur a little bit more overhead. But you get a lot of things for free that don't exist in other programming languages. And we're going to see more of that as we go on. So. Coming back over to here. It's okay. All right. So we've done math. Now, again, we just talked about there are two kinds of base. We saw fixed num, that's your integer. Right? It's all whole numbers. 1, 2, 3, or 42, because 42 has to appear in every slide ever in technology. And a float, which is just simply a number expressed in decimal form, such as pi. So that being said, we can go through those. Now, I'm going to go ahead and do a few of these in the interpreter. But just to show you some of the object orientation here, 7 f div 2, that is a float divide, right? Because the first line we know, we've, we've seen before, if you programmed, you force it into a floating point by put, making one of, your argument, one of your expression pieces in the left-hand side a float. Easy enough. If you don't want to go to that trouble, or you don't know if it's going to come in as an integer or a float, you can do this, f div 2, and it will say, whatever it is, give me the outcome that is a float. 4 divided by 3.0, that's going to give us a number we'll look at, round to 2, and then 2r, again, something you get for free. So we're going to go and take a look at that, because the 2r is the one that kind of made my day when I got started in this. So, 
obviously we know that if we do 7 divided by 3.0, right? We're going to get that. And then we're going to go 7 divided by 3.0. And we are going to round it to 2. That's exactly what we think, right? We can do 5 divided by 3, which gives us that. Sorry. 5 divided by 3.0, which gives us this. Can I do that right? Yep. 5 divided by 2.0. Or I can do this. Because sometimes you just want to see a mistake. <laughs> and two. There you go. No? What am I typing wrong? Oh, a dash. Is that an underscore? Does that do it for me? I think I just lost my microphone. Am I right? Can you guys still hear me? We're still good? No idea what I lost. Okay. On the floor? Okay. So we get our lovely friend, the rational number. Turn it into a fraction. So you don't have to figure out what's my fraction. I'm going to make some sounds in the video. They're going to hate me on YouTube. So you get the rational fraction for free because of the object. Now this gets a little weird when you do thirds because you get some crazy number like 6 million over 5 million something. So, but for halves, it's pretty useful. Go ahead and head back here. I'm just going to stay tied to the lectern because now I can actually see my screen. So we've done the floats. Now some string stuff. Again, strings are objects. So we should be used to this. We have a cat. We have a rat. That will just give us a string object. We can capitalize the whole string. I mean, if you do this on a web form, when you start looking at Rails, you get people that like to be funny and put stuff into your database. I see this all the time in my day job where you have no idea what the person was doing when they put it into the form, but nothing makes sense. And when you're doing a mail merge, the mail people will get really angry with you when you get strange stuff like this, because it fails the postal sort, believe it or not. So capitalize does that. Pause, reverse, and become swap. So we're swapping the characters, right? OK, bad pun. I know. I had to throw one in my slideware somewhere. Cat goes meow. There's string concatenation. Cow goes moo. This is also a string concatenation. And hello.length, again, a string, just a plain out string, not declared as a variable, has length as an operator, as an object. So you don't have to sit and put it into a, into a variable or do anything else. So on the way in, you can check it. So we're going to go ahead and let's pull out the next slide. If you want to do some demos. So strings and things. Actually, no. We're going to go ahead and skip that. Is everybody good with this? Because we have a lot of programmers in the room, and I really don't. I want to get to the stuff at the end, because there's some better stuff as we go through. Is everybody good with this? Anybody want to see these? No? Last call? OK. So we'll skip that. So mix and match. So first line, anybody think that 2 times cat's going to work? Anybody? Anybody think that ho times 3 is going to work? Anybody? No? OK. This right here, this 5 dot times, that's taking an integer, giving it times. This is a built-in enumeration. Enumeration is where you can go over an object through each piece and get more things out of it. So this is really simple. We have the block notation here with the braces. And it's going to print hello 5 times. That's it. No for loop, no anything, you get that for free. And then here, you have an integer, t underscore s, changes it to a string. So you can do that. There's a couple other ways to do that. We'll see them as we go. But again, one of the interesting things with, with Ruby is what you get for free. So you know, we're going to go two times cat. 
Okay, we get an error. We understand that. Now, wait a minute. So that works. That's actually a shortcut in Ruby. So if you ever had those knowing things, like I need a padded string that's a divider bar on an output file, or I need to put a little box around something, take your character, multiply it by whatever, and there you go. For free from the string object. Nothing more needed. So again, there's just little things in Ruby that as you dig into it, makes your life easier. You know, silly things that are just for productivity. And that's, again, that's one of, your, well, that's one, that's one of the main benefits that you get. It's built for our speed, getting work done. So interaction I. Now you've seen puts. It's literally just put string. Syntactically, one of the things that we're working for, we worked for in Ruby is conciseness. Things to make sense. Gets is git string. Well, that's easy enough. We've got a standard library for file I.O. and one for, CS for CSVs. We're going to look at the first three right now. CSV will come a little bit later. So, now of course, in my day job, I work with data. Lots and lots of data. And apparently it didn't like that. There we go. We're going to get out of the Ruby interpreter. And we're going to look at I'm half blind with no color, I can't see it. So we're going to look at some names. Now, this is from the Social Security Administration. They publish a set of data that is every single name that was made in each year, going from 1880 to 2013. Right? And it gives you the name, how many things are in there. So we're just going to look at this small list, 200 names. I'm just reading it in and printing it out. Let's look at the code that does this. OK. So I'm using file, which is just a class. Not required as part of your standard package, so you don't have to require, include anything. You open your data list, read it. Now again, remember that block we talked about with the two braces? There's two ways you can write a block. You can do the braces on a single line. In this case, it's a little bit easier to read when it's on two lines, so we use the do end. And this is nested, so there's a do and block, two of them. One nested in the other. And all we're doing is just taking in the line and adding it to a big string. This is a pretty common operation when you're wanting to do a file output. I have a large amount of data. I need to make a file on the fly and transport it out. Do this on websites all the time. So that'll work. That's a very small set. But you know, here's the thing. That can get pretty big. So let's do this. Now this is a little bit different. Let's open this one up. We talked about there were a couple different ways to do string concatenation. There's the plus, which we all know and love. There is the double arrow, right, which is appending. And there's also something called string interpolation, which we're going to look at down here. Now if you've seen Perl, this is going to be a pretty normal concept or something you're familiar with. So we want to interpolate. We use the the pound, and then put our, our variable name in here. Now that can be a variable name, it can be an string expression. You could put a string, literally the string dot capitalize if you want in there. This will act just like a function, but it just goes all in line so it's easier to read, right? All those things do the exact same thing, but you'll notice it's wrapped up in xreport, which is a method inside of benchmark. Now here's the thing. Every day, I'm dealing with about 20 gig files. So I don't have time to sit there and wait for runtime because I usually get the file and have an hour to present. <laughs> and that's all you get. So you get real concerned with things like speed. And this shows me speed. Now, this is operating on the short list of names. And you can see here you have your the user system total and real. So you're real. I mean, it's not that much different, right? It's only a couple thousand names. You know, 0 0.007, 0 0.002, 0 0.01. Okay, that's fine. So 
what happens when we use a slightly bigger file? Uh-oh. Well, good old string plus is failing, isn't it? Because that's only about 70,000 records, 90,000 records rather? It's not good, right? But look, concat came right back. That's the double arrow. So you can see here, you're starting to get orders of magnitude difference. So these are things that benchmark is really, really useful for. Anything you do can be wrapped in a benchmark, and this is going to tell you how fast it is. So this is your bread and butter tool when you're getting started. You're trying to figure out, how do I make this run better? Why is this not performant? Because one of the things I've seen you know, all over the blog, well, Ruby isn't performant. Well, it's like a guy at my, work, at my uh, office says, it's not that the language isn't performant. It was the programmer that wasn't performant. I mean, that's 90% of your problems come from having the wrong construct, and this is how you catch it, right? And again, same thing. Big three, why not two, four? Maybe not. I've done a really, really, really big one to just kind of show you I only did concat. It took nine seconds for the regular concat. The other one, I let it sit at home for about a day and a half. After a day and a half, I decided I was done waiting for it to finish. So orders of magnitude, this really does make a difference. And this is something that you really want to think about. And thankfully, Ruby has the tool baked in. So we're going to come back here. Symbols. All right. Who here who's programmed has come up with something like north is 1, south is 2, east is 3, west is 4, and define that as a constant so you can carry that through all the rest of your code. Anybody? A bunch. Right. So it's kind of a waste, isn't it? All those lines to set up something that you visually are just going to use north and never care about the value. I mean, you could set it to be north is cat, south is dog, and no one would care because all they're going to see is north. Right? Ruby gives these for free. It's an, ab it's an abstract for a constant value. It's maintained globally, and we'll see that here in a second. And it's guaranteed to be unique. So let's take a look at symbols. All right. So type, right? So you are moving north. I do work for online game systems, so my examples are very heavily tilted towards games. I apologize. So we're going to go ahead and look at this. Easy enough. This little colon. Now, notice, <laughs> and I was working on this in VM, if you couldn't tell, with WQ in the comment. Some direction north. If direction is south, this colon may make the symbol. And that's it. No declaration. Puts we're moving south. Otherwise, if it's north, we are moving north. That's it. You don't have to worry about the, what values contained therein. You don't have to worry about where is it going to be. It's just there. It's free. And it works. Now, the question becomes scope. So let's look at this. So I have a moving people. And it's defining a symbol west inside the scope of this method. This little def and end. This is a method construct, all right? So you can define methods outside of classes or inside. We'll get to classes here in a bit. Think of this like a function. I'm defining another function. Scope checker, howdy is howdy. I'm only doing that to kind of show something here. My direction north, some direction north, same thing we had before. When we get to the bottom, and I expect that this if howdy, I expect that to fail. I'm sure it's going to fail, right? Because it's out of scope. And that's something that we worry about a lot passing variables around. But I'm going to do the same thing with the symbol down here, where my direction is west. Now, west was only defined in the scope of the method above, moving people. But yet, here I'm going to try and use it anyway. So, symbol for two, right? I get a fail. Exactly what I thought. It is dying on howdy. Apparently, it's not a Texan. Can't take howdy. So, we're going to do this again. 
where I have commented that out, Quest works. Globally guaranteed. You set the symbol in a method somewhere, it's available everywhere else you want to use it. Everywhere else you want to use it. It's a, symbol that, it's a feature that's unique to Ruby and it's kind of nice. Because it gets you away from having to worry about numbers and defines and did I define this as one and is this going to fail? Nope. Give it the name. Symbol is global. Guaranteed unique. Again, you get it for free. And you can't tell I like free. Because I have I like lots of free code, not lots, I don't have lots of free time. So anything the language can do to help us out is a benefit and a blessing. So, that's symbols. Classes and blocks, right? We've already kind of seen these. Classes represent objects. This is classic or ob object orientation. We could do another whole day-long talk on object-oriented programming, so we are not going to do that here today. But essentially, you take things in the real world and you represent them as objects. Uh, a ball, a car. All cars have wheels. All cars have a color. All cars have a max speed. So you make one class that represents all cars. And then you define each of those attributes as something inside. Easy enough. Now your standard Ruby classes are open. What does that mean? Well, you know, in other languages you have to inherit, and then you use that inherited class to do other items. Sometimes you can merge. But Ruby classes you don't, and we're going to see this more in just a second. And blocks are just chunks of code. Again, in the curly brace, or in your do, do and syntax. And really, it's, go ahead. It will be. I'm going. Um, I, I'm going to give it to the self staff, and they're going to post it. I'm also going to give you guys my email address after the camera is off, so you guys can ask me for it, and I'll send it to you. So, um, so that being said, blocks are chunks of code with the do and the brace methodology. And by the way, the, what, when you choose to use one versus the other is when it makes the most sense. Ruby is very flexible, so they want you to use what's most readable. So if it's a one-liner, it's about this long, put on one line, use your brace syntax, move on. If it's going to be four or five lines, like that example with the reading in the file, use your do end. Again, readability. We'll talk, we'll have something interesting with that later. Wow. Okay. So we're going to get to the advanced examples. I overprepped a little bit because I wasn't sure if we'd have beginners or lots of folks who already know. Because the first set was for well, from my poor wife in the back. I know. I'm going to get it later. So, all right. So, we've got a couple other things in here. We're going to start with, let's see. We've got read symbol, interactive, and uh, read angle three. Hmm. That's the last one. CSV, there it is. We want to talk about CSVs. There we go. All right. So, CSV, I want to count how many people's first name have the same initial, or how many times that initial is there. So, I could just go ahead and use a string on each one and say this, self zero one. But I do this a lot. And by a lot, I mean a lot. So define a little class here. But notice this class string. Well, string is already a Ruby class. And this is about open. I'm not inheriting. I'm just saying class string, mix it in. Put it right there, boom. Now any string of any type will have initial. I'll get the first character out. Done. Yes, sir. Correct. Just tagging on to it. So the rest of the stuff in string will be available, which you'll see down here. I mean, string hasn't changed. And I did the same thing for integer. So this is essentially a prop function, because we have a lot of programmers in here. They have closures and lambdas and anonymous functions. So I'm sending this to join, because I want to pretty the string up. You know, If I get a string and I say I have 1,347,813 people, when I hand that off to my business user and they see a number this long with no commas, they look at me and go, what? 
So it happens. I mean, these are things you have to think about. So this just takes it, and it's, like it says, I it, it's an integer class, so it's going to get an integer, self, change it to a string, make that individual characters, reverse, make it to, to underscore a, make it an array, reverse the array, slice it by threes, map it to a join, and join it with a comma. Done. Oh, and reverse it back, so it's going forward. Done. That's it. Yeah, but the thing is, you can literally read right through this, right? Take my number, make it a string, put it to characters, make it an array, reverse it, slice it, join it by a comma, and reverse it. Done. I've done that same thing in a couple other languages, and trust me, to do that, by the time you're done explaining it, you're retired. So I'm looking at you, C and C++. I mean, really, just things happen. So again, you get stuff for free, built in. It's an object. And we're going to do some stuff with a hash. Now, hashes and arrays, again, objects. You don't have to really define. This is some of the flexibility of Perl coming into play. So I'm looking at year of birth 2013, that's the most recent file, and I'm going to get my account, put things in, and then I sort it. I notice you can sort the hash by the Q value, right in line, and now I'm going to reverse the order so we see it, because if it goes in ascending, you're going to see the least count to the most count, but we want to see it the other way. And then of course I'm calling my function here, right, too pretty. So, making it easy to read. But all of that is done in what fits on that screen. So we're going to go back to here. Sorry, no. We're going to get out of here. And again, this is just reading in a CSV. Pull off. Yeah, I know what the last one's supposed to be. So again, go through the file. And this is reading line by line, okay? So, again, and it's adding up each name, taking the initial, doing all that work, and giving us a nice, pretty output. Now, obviously, if I was doing reporting, I'd do a lot more with it, but we don't want to get that complicated because we'd be here all day. But again, just really quick. So, yeah, we don't want to go there. We're done with that right now. So, so. Let's move on to something near and dear to my heart. So, I'm going to make a character because we like playing games. And this is what I do in my spare time. So, for those of you who know HP Lovecraft and the whole Elder Ones and Call of Cthulhu, we're setting up characters that have some of those stats. So, this is their name, and they have a profession. And they have valor, right? Because when you're charging into the face of darkness, you have to have a little bit of courage. So we set up a character. Again, this is a class. So unlike the open class before that had a string, what we're looking at here is a completely custom class. Now, some things we can talk about real briefly. You see there's attribute reader, name. You can't change your name, so I'm only going to let you read it. I have an attribute accessor. Now, that's we don't see the other thing in here. Because normally when you set up, you set up a get and a set method. You get the value out, you set the method. Well, with this, much like in uh, when you're working in mono with, with C sharp, I know it's evil, I'm sorry. But you can set up a single line, accessor, that now has a get and set method. No more code needed. It's just there. So it saves you dozens of lines of code. Th this, there's only the one. But when you're making an object and you have 30 of these, Instead of 30, 30 get methods and 30 set methods, you have 30 lines of that. Done. So again, we get our initialize. We've got about 10 minutes, so we're going to kind of start moving along so we get some questions at the end. And we define, are you a character? Because in any game, are you a character or are you a non-player character? It's an important question to know, so we'll put that in our standard first iteration. Make a, ha a new hash. Again, hash is an object, so we just make a new hash. We're not going to set its default. You saw in the other file where I said hash new, gave it an argument of zero. You can set a default value to your hash, so when you make a new hash, it has a value. That way, if you want to do something where you're adding up, like I did before, you can't start with nil, which is their version of nothing. Nil plus two will fail. 
So you set a default value. And I set some players, John, Calvin, and Liza. And I go through and I just list them out. Now here's the thing. When I list them out, I'd like to know their name, their profession, stuff about them. But, again, this is just a rough pass. Well, I know their name, and I know they have an object somewhere that I made and defined as a class. That's useful, right? <laughs> I'm sure that people playing this game are going to be really, really th th thrilled to know that their object, you know, 0 by 7 FC 40. Yeah, that's useful. So, let's improve this a little bit, shall we? So, same thing, right? We have Valor. Now, puts, put string. All it's doing is every argument on the other side, it's calling it to underscore s, to string method, right? Everything's an object. So when you say puts and a double quoted string, well, you're not just sending a string, you're sending an object, right? The receiver puts is getting your message, string object. So we're going to define this. Define 2s. So now anything that has a 2s, which is puts and print and other objects to put out to the screen or to uh, output, put the player info and name in, put in some spaces to make it a little prettier, put in their valor, their valor, current valor score, and put that in a string player info. You know, one of the things about methods is there's a couple ways you can return. It will always return the last value. So if you do a calculation, you can explicitly name it like that. But if you put 2 times 4, your method will return 8, if it's the last line in there. It's a Boolean operation, it returns true. Be a little careful with that, because sometimes it returns values you don't expect. So for readability, go ahead and be explicit. But again, here we go. Basic stats, that's awesome. We have valor, we have characters, great. We have characters, now what in the world are they gonna do? Well, we don't really have NPCs yet, because we're not that far along in game development. So we're gonna look at doing what players do best, mess with each other. So, I'm killing you, aren't I, Jeff? The guy in the front row worked with me for years, and he knows my morbid sense of humor when it comes to doing things like this. So. Again, we have our standard. We've already defined it, right? We have our class methods, his character. Add a little thing, add skill, name effect. Add skill to the skill array, right? We defined it up our skill hash, rather. We defined a new hash up there, that's that last line, and we gave them a perception stat. They have a new stat. And we define our two string. And again, we go through the two stats here. If I wanted to, I could probably put them into an array and iterate. I don't, but I do do this with skills. So I take my hash, again, enumeration, going through each object in the hash, it's free. Each do, the key and the value, and it outputs just this, the skill name because the value is an anonymous function. So when we come down here, right, we have do skill, takes the skill name in the target, we check for if it's nil, because we obviously, if, it, if they try and type something in that doesn't exist, we don't want them to do it. That's bad, bad pacing for them. And we make sure that the target's a character, because we don't have NPCs yet. So we don't want them to try and do this on a box. And we run through. And we have a little error message, right? Has no such skill. Shows them that they couldn't do it. Right, goes through. And notice we have the call syntax. We take the hash using the key, which gives us the value. We call using our target we passed in. Now this is called a call, or it's proc syntax. And procs are simply where you take an anonymous function and you call it. There you go. So, set up our characters. Game is afoot. So we are gonna call out, we're gonna see what they're at, what their starting stats are. We'll add some skills, right? Liza is a mystic, so she has Terrify. That's a good magical kind of skill. And we have Calvin, who has Boost Morale. And we have John, who gathers clues. He's an investigator, right? So, they each get... Now notice, literally setting up a lambda, right? It explicitly gives you the word. So here's your, here's your 
block of code, your chunk. Now, the nice thing with this is that we don't have to find all these somewhere. We can just say, hey, I'm going to pass it on the fly. So if you have something you want to design in later, where you just want to pass it, give them the skill that's not anywhere else or defined anywhere else, there you go. As long as it's valid and works in your game syntax, you got it. Done. We're going to go through and show all the players, which is going to show the skills they've got. And we're going to have Liza use her skill to terrify poor John. Yes, poor John. And we're going to see what happens after. They're going to respond again using their skills. We're going to see what happens after that. So again. I should do that with less. Because less is more. So, game is afoot. Starting stats, everybody has 10 valor, 5 perception, easy enough. We add the skills and we print out OK. So we see they have their stats and their skill. Each has one. We can add as many as we want. So, Liza tries to use her skills. One goes through. There's no success message. That's just something we want to add later, right? But we do have the no such skill. Afterwards, well, we see that John's valor has, jumped, has dropped down to seven. So John and Calvin respond. They don't fail any of their skills. They, they don't typo. They get in. You've got, again, Valor 10, Perception 5, because for, uh, for Calvin, nothing's happened to him. John went back up to 10 Valor. He added 5 Perception. He's not going to get caught again. He'll see it coming and avoid it, right? And Liza stays the same, still has her Terrify skill. Now, again, all that for free. There's a lot of overhead that we're not seeing. If you've worked on other languages, you know exactly how much we did with about this much code for free. So that being said, that is concludes the, the demo part of the presentation. I'll come back here. I'm going to open it up to get back where we were. Questions. I might even have answers. No guarantee. Anybody? So if you were modifying those skill functions mm -hmm. uh, to be a little more comprehensive, would you still use lambdas, or would you choose to make them first-class citizens, or how would you do that instead? Well, it depends on how we're doing it. I might have a set definition of classes so we can associate them to, say, player classes, guilds, you know, the set fixed things we all know, priest, cleric, investigator, whatever. And then have special, special items that are add-on skills, right, uniques, and have those be lambdas. So we might have a different skill tree a fixed skill tree, and then your lambda-based skill tree, which is things you get from quest awards that are totally unique to you. That's a design decision. We'll get, we get there when we, you, know, you get, we make those decisions when you cross that bridge, but both work. Is this running off a, is this running off a server with an interpreter out there and then coming down to a client, or do you download a, an interpreter locally and run this locally? Um, Ruby comes by default with OS X, which is what I'm running here. On my Linode, I have it installed. Um, it comes in your package management, so it, I'm a Debian guy, so app get Ruby. And you get, uh, they have 1.9.3, this is Ruby 2.0. Either works, both are supported. So they have a, a Windows installer as well. Uh, they have source code if you want to compile it. It's really up to you. So you can put this anywhere. So, including embedded devices, by the way, they're branching into that. The next couple iterations of Ruby are getting much more efficient because Max, the guy that came up with this language, he wants to get it more into embedded work. So I'm going to start playing with it on my Arduino soon. Maybe next year I'll have something with that. We'll see. Um, you said that all classes are open. Does that ever, does an issue ever come into, um, into consideration of security of certain classes? Like in Java, if you don't want a certain classes to access, you make them private or not? Yes, we didn't get into those keywords, but you do have, just like in Java, private, protected, public. So you can, you can protect your methods. Okay. And hide them, encapsulate them. Okay. Any other questions? Anybody? So I'm going to leave you with this. And again, we talked about readability all throughout this. There's an old thing from Comp Lang C++ from when I was growing up. 
Always code as if the person who ends up maintaining your code is a violent psychopath who knows where you live. And for those of you who have been in any kind of code maintenance job, you know exactly how important this is. Because you never know. And sometimes the guy that maintains your code gets promoted and suddenly they're your boss. <laughs> been there, done that. So thankfully I wasn't on the receiving end of that one. <laughs> but again, just be careful out there. And we'll leave you with some more stuff. Right? So if you want to learn more, the pickaxe is the seminal work. Dave Thomas wrote it. No, not the guy that used to be the lead of Wendy's. And that is the book. In the back it has the complete RubyDoc. RubyDoc.org. Just like uh, PearlDoc, you can get all of your information, classes. It's also available with RI on the command line. Actually, look, I'll show you guys that right before we leave. And RubyLang is the language. You can download the, uh, the interpreter and everything else there. Find some websites, go look at stuff. Cool project. So yes, yes, I use a Mac. And I want a package manager. Homebrew gives me that. I can install all of my Linux stuff right there. Rails is a web framework. That's what I'm going to be learning right now. That's why I started on Ruby, was getting to this. I was a web developer for years. So it's one of the most popular frameworks out there. And then Discourse. Who here knows the name Jeff Atwood? Who here reads Coding Horror blog? Or has seen Coding Horror? Yeah, Discourse is his new, is his new project. And it's taking, if we've all seen PHP bulletin board, PHP BB, yeah, go look at a site in, way, in the Wayback Engine from 10 years ago and look at the same site today. Nothing different. So Discourse is trying to change it for the new way we interact with our devices with mobile streaming in as we talk. It's really cool and it ju it's just about to come out of beta. They're now saying it's stable. It's been out for about a year and a half now. So again, some really cool stuff going on. We didn't even get the gems. so. Maybe next year in the intermediate talk. And thanks much. Everybody have a great time with itself, okay? Customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.